here and do lots of that kind of thing, but I'm also the coordinator of these talks. And um, bringing Paul here was sort of a, a natural extension of a lot of the kinds of work that we do here in the center. But the center is really an amalgam of programs that are dedicated to linking to real world science and real world issues with real, real, real world solutions. But honestly, most of what we all do here is either generate knowledge or translate knowledge in, in some um, meaningful way into curricula or practice and policy. Most of us, however, are not heavily involved in sort of the extended kinds of educational and dissemination practices that make our kind of work we do really sustainable, largely because that involves a kind of expertise that most of us don't have. So, and then sort of business and tech tech expertise and uh, marketing and kind of uh, marketing background that we don't have. So um, over the past few years, I've had the, the great good fortune to work with Paul, uh, Paul and Joe Ellison and other people um, uh, work at eCornell, and we thought it would be a really great opportunity to bring, bring their services here to you so you can, you can learn a little bit about how eCornell interfaces with people at Cornell. And I suppose it's just people at Cornell, right? You guys don't work with other entities at this point. But it's an amazing vehicle for really being able to disseminate and to, to extend the, uh, the amplitude and impact of the kind of work that we all do, especially if there are natural uh, natural translations into psychoeducational or training programs. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit. Oh, I should probably just mention too, the center uh, is directly uh, is directly sponsored by the, the College of Human Ecology, but we are a central wide resource. We do have a variety of programs in addition to our top of 12 series such as the How to Conduct Research in Real World Settings series. And this summer will be the first annual trans, uh, TRSI, Translational Research Summer Institute, which will bring people from probably largely outside of Cornell to learn how to do some of these things. This, uh, the kind of stuff you guys do fits right on into that whole spectrum of what translational research is, how we can use what we're learning to make a real world. So you can find out more um, by picking up materials outside the door. All right. So I'm just going to read your bio, okay, because yeah, I don't <laughs> know your bio. I just know you in the current course. Um, Paul Krauss is the CEO of eCornell and the Associate Vice Provost for Online Learning here at eCornell. He's responsible for eCornell and collaborating with the senior leadership of the university and its faculty to facilitate online learning, innovation, and growth. Uh, he was formerly the CEO of Element K, which was an online learning company based in Rochester. He grew Element K into a leading online learning provider before it was acquired by Skillsoft. He also co-founded Matrix Insights, which is an online platform for personalized leadership development. He was an MBA from University of Rochester and BS here, so I guess you were kind of coming home. So. Yeah. Um, and you've been at eCornell for how long? Three years now. Three years. Uh, you've done a lot of three years. Thank you. <laughs> right. Well, it's an honor to be here. I'm really excited to uh, to talk a little bit about online learning, and and uh, you know I'm I'm taking some risks here because my presentation is largely um, show and tell, and it's all you know anybody who's ever tried to do a lot of demonstrations live when anything can go wrong it does go wrong. So we'll see. Well, hopefully it'll all go smoothly. Um, uh, you know, under under pressure here. But first of all, just how many how many people here have have taken an online course? How many? So most of you. How many have built an online course or delivered an online course? So I do see several people uh, that may be relatively new to online learning, and, and I know there's some people here with a lot of experience in online learning. So it's a pretty mixed audience. Um, today, I my agenda is let's see. I'm going to provide a little bit of background of eCornell and online learning at Cornell, just, just so you know who I am, eCornell, and just the general services that's available across Cornell to support doing more with technology and doing more with online learning as a framework. Um, and then talk about some of the opportunities that online learning provides, and then get into some examples, because I think it, it, I, I always like seeing things, and you know, sometimes seeing things is a lot better than just hearing someone talk about online learning. Um, I would encourage you, please ask any questions as I go, because I like that. It's uh, much more engaging for everybody, if that's the way it works. So it's just very quickly, eCornell, um, how many people of you know, how many of you know something about eCornell? So most of you. So just at a very high level, it's been around a long time now, particularly in internet years. Started in 2000, so 17 years old. 
Um, some of the early years were a little rough, I hear. Um, but we, we have oversight. We have, we have a board that consists of the deans and some trustees. We're 100% Cornell. We kind of have a unique setup where we're set up for accountability, meaning that, you know, our goal is to generate revenue and, and generate impact, you know, for the, the units that we work with. Um, it's something where revenue has to, you know, flow from to Cornell versus being a cost center. So, um, our purpose is really to help Cornell extend the reach, extend reach using online learning and, and also generate revenue for Cornell. And kind of, uh, kind of this is the way we kind of looked at it um, early on was uh, take uh, the whole idea of, of, of you know, founding an institution where any person can find instruction in any study and then help you make that anytime, anywhere. Sense? All right. So the way the way eCornell works, um, eCornell does not try to be a subject matter expert in any, any replace faculty or the the academic unit, but we really provide a set of services um, in three main areas: design and development, some some expertise, um, along with other units that I'll talk about in a moment here at Cornell to that really say here's here's best practices for you know you're doing things in the classroom, you want to do things online, how do you best do that and provide support for that? That's design and development. We also provide support for the operations, running the courses online, and, and things like a 24 by 7 help desk, um, you know, for students uh, around the world. Things like an, a, a technology platform where you can just kind of turn on a course. And then, of course, perhaps the biggest and most challenging one is just marketing enrollments. So as soon as you go online, getting people to your <laughs> course, especially you know, trying to get someone registered, is 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 you're competing with every other institution, the internet at, at, at large, in order to do that. So a lot of effort goes into marketing and enrollment support. So just zooming out for a moment for Cornell, there's a lot of different things going on in the whole realm of online learning and technology-enhanced learning. A lot going on. And I and I have a few initiatives here, which I'll talk about. Just today, we'll see quite a few examples of non-credit professional certificate programs. Um, you know, something I'm involved in is also helping extend into online and blended professional master's programs targeted towards working professionals. Kind of these are both what, what I would consider non-traditional students, students that, you know, aren't here on campus, they're not undergrads, they're not, they're not people that are going to take a year or two, you know, off and come to Ithaca for a program. There's MOOCs. How many of you have, have heard of MOOCs and taken a MOOC? Anyone taken a MOOC? All right. Um, there's undergraduate courses, of course. There's um, quite a few that are done um, online in winter and summer sessions. And then there's hopefully technology enhanced learning in all the courses at Cornell, or most of the courses at, at Cornell. And there's a couple of supporting organizations here at Cornell. This is a very big picture. There's eCornell, what I deal with on a day to day basis. And you can see we kind of support a lot of the professional programs, um, the professional master's programs, Office Synergy, and some of the MOOCs. And then there's another um, uh, organization, the Center for Teaching Innovation, which um, is kind of the result of a recent merger. If I get this wrong, let me know, Diane. The Center for Teaching Excellence and certain aspects of academic technologies um, have been combined to really provide um, some great support for everything from MOOCs to undergraduate courses and, and, tech, and, and especially technology enhanced learning in, in traditional courses. I'll talk more about BPI in a minute. Um, and of course, there's supporting resources in many of the different colleges and schools across campus. And um, there's an online learning community uh, called CLLC, Cornell Online Learning Community. And um, I'm, I'm fortunate to be joined by uh, Diane Sembler. For those that don't know, she's, she's here. and. and that's always willing to help. Um, great resource. She um, is part of the Center for Teaching Innovation. She also, I think, is are you the lead for CLLC? You certainly the one that seems to keep the, the, the trains running on time as far as the overall online learning community, for, which is basically there to share best practices across campus on, 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 on doing things with online. So that's kind of the big, big picture of the supporting organizations. Just to before I move on, I did want to just mention a little bit more about the CTI organization, the Center for Teaching Innovation, which is kind of a sister organization of, of, of Cornell, um, really focused on providing uh, a range of programs and services and workshops and um, some really great resources around helping faculty uh, do innovative things in the classroom and beyond. And that includes 
using technology. So that could be, how do I best use Blackboard? How do I flip my class? How do I do a whole range of things? And so um, there's just a wealth of knowledge and resources within CTI. So especially, you know, when it, when it um, you know, um, involves, uh, you know, how do you actually take something that you're doing, um, you know, in a traditional classroom here on campus and, and, and doing it in a more innovative way? Does that sound right? I, I will say that uh, there's sort of obviously a, a strong intersection with online learning because, as I'll talk about in a minute, online learning and some of the things that you can do with online learning, is, you know, kind of is very similar to just technology enhanced learning. So if you create a great a set of series of great videos, you know, that can be used in a lot of different ways. That can be used to to, to uh, innovate in the classroom and do things like flipping the classroom, but it also, those same assets can be used, you know, to create, you know, entirely online experiences. And solve other issues. So that's the that's the big picture foundation for e Cornell and uh, Cornell University. And there's really three main opportunities that I'll focus on before getting into demos of, of how online learning can possibly help. And I think I just started covering this already. One is instructional innovation. So um, you know it's you know online learning is just one of several interrelated things when it comes to innovation. Um, it's something that, that um, uh, Diane and the CTI team work on quite a bit is, is, is in this realm. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this today. But online learning really is very much related and supports things like active learning or flipped classrooms. As I already mentioned, if you create great assets, you can use those to flip the classroom. Um, it supports programs like engaged learning. So you know, if you're sending students out into a community, and they need the flexibility to be able to get access to content in a non-traditional ways. You know, it's all interrelated. So certainly one of the main strategic objectives uh, that I've heard from um, President Pollock is in fact the whole idea of, of instructional innovation and online learning, and that is a key part of that. And this all sort of fits, all fits together. The thing we're going to spend the most of today talking about is um, innovative ways to reach non-traditional students. So that could be, you know, primarily working professionals are the ones that are the people that, that I deal with on a regular basis, extension programs, um, and thought leadership and awareness type programs. Just way of reaching people that are non, not the students that we typically see here on campus. And lastly, uh, generating revenue. And generating revenue is, um, I think, uh, really important, you know, certainly because a couple things. One is that, you know, at Cornell, our core one of our core missions, of course, is to is very high quality educational experiences, and that's directly correlated to your ability to generate revenue. If you can't generate revenue with, on, a, on a course, then you, the course is kind of first thing you do is you take the instructor out and say, "Here's just a series of videos," right? And so your edu education experience can start being degraded if, in fact, you start having to to do it. So certainly, one of the things that that we spend a lot of time thinking about is how do we actually create um, you know high-end learning experiences that we can in fact support with revenue so that we can continue to invest in building high quality um, educational experiences and of course um, generating revenue also helps us support the mission of the university or the mission of the institute that we're working with or whatnot so certainly online presents the opportunity for that any questions so far right now I'll get into the demos all right so I have several different types of programs. We'll see um, how many we get through in the time that we have allotted. Uh, and everything from micro-credentials for working professionals to extension programs, um, web series to stay engaged with the community and so on. So I'm gonna walk through, I'm gonna just start going through these and I encourage you to ask questions as we get started. Um, I'm actually going to play a video that to kind of one of the, the key things that eCornell you know, kind of does and probably the bread and butter of Cornell and the way we've existed has really been these professional certificate programs that are 100% online um, that typically take three to six to nine months to complete and maybe $3,000 or $5,000 or $1,000, kind of a pretty big range of things. And I have a video that kind of will, will help you quickly see who the target audience is, what the marketing message is for these, as well as probably more efficiently um, show you kind of some of the, uh, the components of the course. I'm gonna play this and hopefully everybody will be able to hear it. 
Cornell University's online courses offer a flexible, rigorous, and engaging learning experience designed for busy professionals. You can do your coursework at any time of day, and there's no appointed time when you are required to be online. We design the experience to accommodate busy professionals in every time zone, and you'll learn with and from your peers, people like you, only from everywhere and from every type of organization. Courses feature Cornell faculty and the high quality teaching you expect to find in an Ivy League classroom. Each of our online courses consists of a blend of learning activities carefully designed to deliver an experience that is both challenging and engaging. Expert instructors will give you the guidance and feedback you need along the way. And now you're ready to start the course. Your first assignment, meet the class. Share a little something to introduce yourself to your fellow students. If you want, you can post a quick video. We keep class sizes small, so you will be part of a tight but diverse cohort of learners, and you'll get to know your online instructors. Courses are instructed by seasoned practitioners who bring subject matter expertise and years of experience. They lead class discussions, give you guidance on your assignments and projects, and they help you relate the professor's teaching to your own work. You'll have short readings and plenty of opportunities to check your understanding. Each course features a multi-part project in which you relate the concepts, tools, frameworks, and ideas from the course, and you apply them to your specific work circumstances. This is where your Ivy League learning experience joins you at work and follows you into your future. Welcome to Cornell. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a flavor of what it is, but let me actually then slow up and say here's an actual course. This one is, uh, this course is a course by Rob Bloomfield, Strategic Decision Making. And uh, this is the interface for it. But you'll see on the left here, you have uh, everything from a, a, an opportunity to meet your class. And then you have the outline. And uh, the outline consists of everything from reading to little video activities to um, activities of tools that you can download and possibly use. Um, the opportunity to have discussions, reading, and, and of course, projects. And so within a course, um, I'm just going to play a little clip from one of the things Rob does. I will say that, generally speaking, the videos that we do, we try to keep to, you know, well under five minutes because, you know, the research basically says that, you know, you, you start making them longer. It's, it's actually really interesting. You know, you make the, the video 10 minutes, the average time that a student spends watching is something like three minutes, whereas if you make it five minutes, the average time they spend watching is more like four minutes. It's a very interesting thing. I guess at some point they, they wonder what's the point of actually why bother watching the video. So nice, short, crisp videos. To help us make good, quick decisions in a very complicated world, uh, our brains tend to rely heavily on simple rules of thumb. Psychologists call them heuristics. And these are rules that tend to work very well, but when they go wrong, they go wrong in predictable ways. And psychologists call these types of predictable errors biases. I'm going to talk about three very useful heuristics so that I can point out the biases and you can avoid them. The first heuristic is the availability heuristic. We tend to assume that if it's easy to think of cases where stuff has happened, that stuff must happen quite a lot. And if you think about the way our brains work, that actually makes a lot of sense because it's easier and easier to recall things as we see them happening more and more often. Where this goes awry is that there could be a small number of highly publicized cases that are very striking, and that makes them memorable. So maybe someone is asking you whether your assistant is ready for a promotion. What's the first thing that's going to come to your mind? Well, I wouldn't be surprised if it's the one time he made that hugely embarrassing mistake in front of a big client. You know, it. So you get a you get a sense for you know this is covering one specific you know idea one specific principle. You'll notice um, certainly you know it's not scripted. We want you know faculty members simply to teach themselves. We're not trying to correct every uh, or mistake or everything else. You know we definitely are looking for that authenticity. Um, you know that that really comes across. Um, you know I think there's a there's the opportunity to always use graphics. 
Um, sometimes it can just be a PowerPoint that's supportive. Sometimes it can be some, you know, depending on the course, I'll show maybe if we have time later, the chem engineering one, which is just, you know, hard formulas and everything else. So basically the graphics that we use is very dependent on the type of the course as well. Um, and again, I think nice and short. Only happened once. Uh, let's see. There's uh, the opportunity to have different types of, uh, what is this, a, uh, a quiz, you know, basically inline quizzes. Uh, there's the opportunity to, to download tools. So, you know, this in this case is the bias minimization checklist in decision making. Um, and then perhaps I think what's, um, you know, uh, what I think is, is oftentimes the, the, the most um, compelling part of the course is at least uh, is, is really the opportunity to, to engage with others and engage with the instructor. So um, there's a wide range of different course, types of courses out there. There's sort of the so-called self-paced, which do not necessarily have an expert or an instructor involved or an opportunity to engage with, with peers. Certainly, you know, I have a strong bias and, and preference for online experiences that have um, deep, deep integration, deep opportunities to engage. And, and then, you know, looking at the, the, you know, getting feedback from students, we hear from students on a regular basis that it's the most valuable part of the course is actually the ability to interact with their peers and others that are going through similar experiences, um, to learn from them with those experiences and so on. And, and what's really interesting is, um, in many, many ways, it's certainly a different type of engagement, but in many ways, the online course can give you a higher level of engagement. So students that may not have a chance to actually speak in a class or might you know, want a chance to think about you know, something before they talk, I mean, just, I'm just shocked at how well thought out the, 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 the responses are and how deep and how much work go into sort of the responses and, and, the, and the collaboration on these, on these courses. And certainly if anyone, Doubt that I definitely encourage you to actually experiment with the course and see see what can happen. It's a, it's a you know I think you you'd likely to at the end of the day agree that actually how much interaction there is and, and how deep that interaction is actually can be much greater than here. It's different it's different than live. It doesn't have the same spontaneity as maybe a live event has, but um, it certainly has a lot of it, it's a very effective communication vehicle. Make sense? Yes, please. What are some of the uh, things you do or ways that you encourage people to to engage in that kind of discussion? Um, That's a great question. So the question is, how do we encourage people to engage in that? And, and, and um, certainly, I'm not an instructional designer, but I've been around a lot of them <laughs> for a long time. So first is just making sure you ask, an, you know, basically sort of an engaging question that is relevant and, and, and so on. Um, I will say that uh, you know, the reality is also making it a required part of the course, so you're required to do. Certainly, um, you know, if you're making discussions non-required, then many students won't won't go through that. Um, uh, I think the you know uh, we have instructors that ask a lot of follow-up questions, and we we really try to facilitate the discussion. So, ask people to respond to what someone else wrote. Um, I will say that you know just one of the things that I found that we we're struggling with right now is just even even though we keep cohorts small and have you know only thirty students in there, just once you have all those in there and, and because every student writes such deep, meaningful stuff, it's overwhelming. I mean it's just like it would take you months to finish the course. So now we're like saying, okay, maybe we do subgroups, right? And then just like you would in a in an environment, okay, have every break up into six person groups. You know, have a discussion amongst yourself and, and you know, basically present, have each group then present their findings to everyone else. So just as you would, almost exactly like you would if we were doing that here, right? Um, because you're not going to have every single person talk for, for 15 minutes. So, uh, Joe, did I miss anything? I don't think so. That's, that's it. I mean, and we're continually modifying it and, and different, you know, we use different types of discussions uh, for different types of learning outcomes, right? So. Uh, sometimes it's uh, discussions are really most valuable to the learners when they can share their own experiences, right, and bring in, because adult learners especially, not only do they want to apply them to their own work, they have experience that they want to build on. And they, and they, and the experiences of other people who's, who might come from a different organization or a different role or a different level of experience or a different functional area or a different country, you know, you're, you're eager to hear what that person has to say. But then there are, sometimes it makes more sense to have people discuss a case or something else. So it can be used in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, kind of, kind of partly off subject from a user point of view, rather a developer point of view. I found a trick quiz question generated more activity and interest ah. than a whole lot of other things that people were getting sense. They didn't understand it or they're being misled or whatever, and that led to some very interesting uh, conversations yeah. online. But I think trying to find ways of getting people engaged and so on, I think, is, is really um, interesting. In fact, one of the benefits of this of the discussion, uh, which is also just sort of a, because of the audience that is so working professionals, and as you heard in that marketing video, right, you heard, oh, we can, whatever time zone you're in, and just we're flexible, everything else, it's the asynchronous. And so one of the key terminologies that, if I start throwing out terminology that doesn't make sense, let me know, but... You know, asynchronous versus synchronous. Synchronous just means that everybody's together at the same time, whether online or in person like this. Asynchronous simply means they can have that interaction, but they are not necessarily there at the same time. And so our, you know, these are all, um, you know, these, this particular discussion format is, is asynchronous. No one needs to be there at the same time. We also have office hours and other things to, a, you know, which are optional, but because of this particular audience um, that are synchronous, so that people can come come online at the same time, but you know we still find the strong preference for the flexibility. Thank you. I would add one more thing that adds a little bit onto your question, which is uh, a big part of it too is uh, creating an experience that is that invites interaction, right? Just like in a regular classroom, but, you know, a classroom that's you know where discussion is clearly encouraged and a part of it. Um, you know, it's going to be different from one where you know maybe a 350 person lecture hall. Right, uh, where it's a lot harder to stick your hand up and raise a question. Um, so, so a big part of that too is, you know, that in, in designing a learning experience, whether it's a course like this or something else, that's one of the considerations: is what level of interaction do we want to encourage? How do we how do we make it as welcoming as possible? And we have a few tricks that we include in these courses to do that. And one of the things we're trying to the, the software supports this, this particular software is on Canvas. You know, Canvas is kind of like Blackboard. They're the, the two big players in the market. Um, is is to actually instead of having people write everything out, just do a video response, right? So the software supports just record the, the video response. <laughs> Haven't quite had a lot of uptake on that, but it's always fun when you do, especially since we have you know students from around the world with interesting accents and and, mm -hmm. and so on. So it just adds a whole other dimension of getting you really you know added to it. So. This is, a, this is a sample of a course. Of course, anybody that's interested in, in, in taking a look at one of these, just let us know, and we'll get you hooked up um, and to see one. Let's see. I'm going to switch to kind of a example number two, and this is this is uh, one of the courses uh, developed by Dr. Whitlock here. So, and um, there's, um, you know, this is an example of an extension course. So, in a lot of ways, it's similar, very similar to what we just looked at, right? So, it tends to be well, there's a couple of examples. One, one is, is working professionals like school counselors and others that, that, that um, need to deal with uh, non-suicidal self-injury type issues. Um, and of course, I think there's a new course, which I have up here, is actually geared towards parents. So the, again, the, the opportunity here is to reach this, you know, uh, as I understand it, Janice, you went around, the, you know, among other things, around the country, um, <laughs> conferences and would do training at those, right? That's that's very limited. Try to find, you know, be in the right city at the right time to actually go to this conference. Now it's available to anybody to, to access at any time. Um, and there are, I think, uh, we've experimented with a couple of different formats, both both an expert-led format, instructor-led, which actually does have that collaboration, which also has a community potential aspect to it, as well as self-paced, which doesn't have all that collaborative piece, but has the flexibility of starting at any time, anywhere. So. Um, you know, I think uh, this parent course is actually more on the self-paced variety, right? Yeah, but um, based on the, well, we have two things. One is once people go through the self-paced, and at the end they have an opportunity to be part of a closed Facebook group for parents, that there's a place for them to exchange. And then um, the idea that you had the other night when we talked was having a discussion forum that people could participate in and every time even if you were no longer in the course every time somebody posted there then they would get a notification because parents do want to talk to each other um and it's nice for them to be able to do that in a relatively sort of safe venue but they're not always going to be going through at the same time we may do we may do a, you know a more standard course we'll see as we get going but can i just add one thing because you know you talk about you your your frame is the, the educational <laughs> frame and that is obviously clear and good, but I'll just say from a research end, in addition to being able to kind of get information out across broad swaths of people that I couldn't 
otherwise reach necessarily. I mean, I think the very first participant in the professional course was somebody from Korea. So there's just, we've had lots of international participation. The other thing is we can build, um, we can build as an intervention. So we can build research around it and we have, you know, we have pre and post and we ask for permission to follow people over time so we can do some outcome kind of measures. We haven't done anything more than sort of process evaluation at this point, although that's in the work. So I, I don't think of it necessarily as just an educational tool. I think of it as a potential intervention for people I wouldn't necessarily be able to reach any other way. Um, anyway, so I just wanted for the researchers in the room, I think that might be a useful way to think about it. Yeah. I, um, I know Lisa Nishi um, Brad Bell also have done some similar things with um, you know, kind of building the learning and as an innovate and as uh, an intervention as part of research. That's great. I, I think this this course, um, I, I'm always impressed with uh, what Janice puts together here because it's just it, it's um it's so authentic and um, you know although I think we were just talking before this although the the experience of talking to a camera is really foreign to some of us, especially those of us who need some level of feedback in order to keep kind of have the energy to keep going, but it, you get better over time. And again, we're not looking for perfection. We're looking for, you know, we're looking for authenticity. And I'm just gonna, you know, here you'll see the course is very similar. You have the different, the different pages in the course. And this is the parent course. So, you know, my child is self-injuring health. I'm just gonna play a little clip and Janice, you can leave the room. No one likes to watch them, watch themselves, watch themselves, everything else. We were talking about that earlier, but I think, you know, I'm really impressed because I think it's so, um, I was like, you know, I'm like, I, unfortunately, I don't have a, 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 any children that have this particular issue, but I'm like, it, it still spoke to me, right, as, as a parent, and, and it felt like she was sitting right there and counseling me, and so it's really, really quite You're powerful. I would respond by saying, no, it's not your fault. Can you find things that, that might have contributed? Probably. I, mean, I think any time we're entangled with another person, especially as a parent or a child, there's things that we do to impact each other positively and negatively. I have never, ever once met a perfect parent because people are messy and human politics and families are messy. They're, so <coughs> the challenge for parents isn't being perfect parents. Um, it's, it's being authentic. It's showing your child how to be messy in a way that's real and honest and has integrity and that serves you and others. Isn't she amazing? Yeah. <laughs> I seriously, I started, I was looking at this uh, to get prepared for this morning. I started watching this. I'm like, oh, I'm going to finish the presentation. I had to stop the video. Um, so anyway, this is a this is a fantastic example of uh, basically being able to, to reach others, having a, a positive impact in the world and um, and, and actually, hopefully, supporting research too. So, I'll just also add that my my user, my experience of doing this is you guys have a great studio, and the person who's working with me on the curriculum design like stood behind the camera and just asked me questions. And I told her, I you somebody has to be there. I can't just look at the yeah. camera. So, and I, it was just super easy and friendly and not hard to do at all. So, you guys made it very accessible and friendly. I like dashed over for a couple of hours and dashed back on the picture. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, and I think that's um, kind of we have a role and uh, a support role. Um, both e Cornell and the Center for Teaching Innovation Management has a support role called Instructional Designers, and that's exactly their role is to work with you um, on everything, you know, kind of to support that whole process. Yes. Um, we've been doing some online courses project, and I and to be clear, you know, the business part of it is Models for 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 um, and a number of different resources available depending on the specific situation. So uh, you know certainly in every situation is a bit different. So we need to dig into it. But there are resources available across Cornell to you know to support different types of projects. So if it's a revenue generating project or has the potential for revenue, that kind of puts it in one category. If it's a MOOC where there's a little bit of revenue, but most likely it's going to be a net investment that, that puts it in a different category where there needs to be a source of funds. 
Um, but there are if there are um, if you're like doing um, undergraduate courses and things like that, there's there's existing resources and actually priority for for you know and some CPI for actually supporting that. So it really depends on on the type of project. But there are resources across Cornell to support many different varieties. Yes, um, a variety in different situations for online learning. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think there oftentimes needs to be a source of funds, um, and you know, and that can come from a variety of places. One of the things that eCornell does, and it's not for everything, but if there is the ability to possibly reach a market and have people pay for something, you know, we we try to so we we have an infrastructure in place to actually try to self fund something. So that's that's what we're doing here, right? Our goal certainly is to to you know basically. Uh, sell enough courses or have enough parents or, or counselors, you know, pay for the courses to help sustain the initiative, right? It is it is tough. So, I mean, you know, marketing is, is by, you know, finding that sustainable model is really quite tough. I would, yeah. I would just add that in terms of revenue, that also could take the form of, like, uh, a part of grant funding, for example, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be something that, um, you know, uh, gets gets sold to large organizations for many thousands of dollars. It doesn't have to be, you know, massively revenue generating. It might be, you know, something where there's enough funding, you know, per student or to offset the cost of developing or delivering the learning experience. And there, of course, are also, as you know, a range of of, uh, of ways to approach to approach the cost and doing it in a lower cost way versus higher cost. Where there are, uh, where most of, in, in some some types of learning experiences, most of the costs are upfront and sort of one time, right? Um, and whereas delivering it might be very low cost in other forms where you have certain, like an instructor facilitating it, for example, your cost to deliver that type of learning experience, you know, is going to be higher, but you might have less uh, lower cost to develop something depending on sort of the format of the learning experience. And you'll see a yeah. few other examples. Yeah, so my advice would be talk to talk to myself, to Joe, to Diane, and just, you know, kind of explain what you're trying to do, and then, you know, we can help point you into the resources or the options that you might have, because that's what we do. All right? Yes? Yeah. question about credentialing. Yes. Yeah. How, how, are, are, there, are there factors built in to some of these courses that make it possible to establish, like, say, a professional was going for, um, a course that would give them some additional credential. How can you establish they didn't just put this on, run, and walk away and do their laundry? And like, are there are there things built in that make it possible to establish that they actually have participated in the process? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So, um, and credentials are a pretty wide ranging thing. So there's everything from a degree to a graduate certificate to a professional certificate to a verified certificate to you know and then. You know, and even just CEUs, continuing education. Yet. So, for example, I believe um, one of the versions of this course that we were just looking at, the one for counselors, does is, is eligible for continuing yeah. education units for 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 certain things. And so, there's a process. And, it, and, it, and you know, for continuing education units, mostly what the accrediting body wants to see is that did you in fact validate that this person is who they say they are, right? Do they have you know, some sort of login and, and has a written knowledge transfer that's occurred? So that can be accomplished via uh, a, a quiz, as an example. Yeah, you know, certainly as you move to degree, the, the it's on the opt-in of the stream. There's more formal projects and assessments and everything else. Professional certs are kind of in the middle. You know, there's definitely uh, there's you know you have to complete the assignments that are graded. You have you know um, you need to complete the projects, which are all graded. So you need to successfully complete the program in order to earn it, even a professional certificate. Okay. All right. What do we have next? So um, one of the other, the, just another example, I'm just going to kind of gloss over this one pretty quickly, but it's kind of an interesting different one, which is, you know, one of the things that we're involved in this is, is offering solutions to, to organizations, corporations and, and not-for-profits like the UN, you know, sometimes they buy full, you know, expert-led instructor programs, um, you know, to, for example, the UN wanted to update uh, all the HR professional skills across thousands for hundreds and thousands of HR professionals, you know, they rolled out, you know, some H, you know, ILRs HR courses in a similar format. Sometimes, though, organizations, you know, most organizations actually have a lot of internal training resources, and so they just want resources and things that they can use to actually um, uh, do that development. And so, 
uh, we provide a set of digital assets. Kind of, uh, they, there's no certification involved or anything like that. It's, it's sort of the difference between sort of a class and perhaps a digital textbook. And so this is an example of a, um, you know, a solution that um, an organization may be, make available may make available to to their organization, and you know they can, you know, someone can just go in and um, you know find a, you know, uh, you know, topic that they're interested in. But then these are all one-hour chunks of of learning uh, that uh, on a, you know, a lot of different terminology. So handling uh, terminations and harassments, you know, the ability just to jump into this self-paced, you know, learning experience. Oftentimes, there's a blended learning guide that comes with this. So if you're an organization and you're trying to roll this out, you can um, access the, um, let's see if it works. Yeah, so you'll see it looks very similar in many ways, um, but it's really intended to be, you know, kind of its own standalone and, uh, you know, standalone thing and available to, to employees. So has anybody here used lynda.com or Skillsoft? Because Cornell pays for that for some reason, even though we have something much better than it. <laughs> both of them. Pretty good stuff. All right, so next example I want to show is, um, uh, is oftentimes there's organizations that want to have a, you know, sort of continuous learning, or they want to stay engaged with the community. And so there's, there's a, you know, I want to show an example of something we call web series, but really it's a series of just um, live events. Let me just go to the eCornell website. So you'll see this here. This is an example of something that's um, that's even that's very different, which is just uh, I'm not really ready to invest three months, six months, or nine months of my life. To, and, and thousands of dollars to do a certificate program, but I am interested in staying engaged and, and continuously learning. Um, what can I do? And so um, the idea is, you know, once a month have a one, not unlike this right here, right? Once a month have something of special interest that you know, bring keep, keep people engaged and, um, you know, basically allowing them to invest in themselves. So um, we call it web series. We have a number of different channels and working with different groups on these different channels. And essentially it's, it's, uh, um, it's one hour events. Uh, that you can come to live. Really, there's a live experience. You try to interact with um, the, the, you know, have Q&A during the experience, but then they're also available on demand. And so there's a few different options here. Um, for example, the nutrition uh, group over here with, uh, you know, has Expanding Nutrition Frontiers, and, and this is sort of a mix of, of different programs. Let's see if I can get into one. I'll show you an example of what this looks like. All right, so this is a this is the web series dashboard. I happen to have um, there's a number of different channels you can kind of see. These are the ones that I'm in right here. So uh, let's do innovations in health, hospitality, design, and senior living. So this is uh, kind of see if I can jump into the house. So whereas courses require a lot of upfront work to develop and you know some expense, <laughs> these are actually really quite cheap and easy to do. Um, I can cooperate. Uh, this isn't Hollis, but hopefully this will work. This is an example of um, uh, uh, one of the events. This happens to be using Adobe Connect as a uh, platform. We'll see if it's going to cooperate. I might have gotten logged out. Hello, friends, and welcome to another HR webcast brought to you by eCornell, the ILR School. And uh, today I'm joined by Stephanie Thomas from the ILR School at Cornell University. Thanks for coming, Stephanie. My pleasure. Great. So as you know, you are all signed up to... Uh, so you can kind of get a sense. This, um, in this particular case, there's you know, you just something one person about, Of course. Uh, based on this topic, uh, it's kind of, you know, it, it's kind of a large... In this particular case, we kind of do it as a talk show format where there's a host making it a little bit easier for a faculty and sort of there's some pre, pre-populated questions, if you will, um, and, you know, basically making it a little bit easier to make it more of a discussion versus just sort of a presentation. And um, what we also have is this is live, so you can kind of see... Um, you know, you can see the discussion. I think there's probably up front someone where you where you're dialing in from or where you're coming in from. You can see people from around the world come in and and, 
and um, participate. But this is just a way of getting short bursts of information, staying engaged in the community. So in the case of nutrition, it was, you know what, we have all these nutrition alumni. You know, we want to basically stay engaged with them, um, you know, on a regular basis. Or, you know, hospitality or you name, name the topic. It's a great way to get, it's a great way to, you know, if you have research that you, and, you know, that you want to get out to a, um, you know, to a distributed uh, community, you know, people who are far afield or, uh, or maybe just in a temporal sense, they just haven't been part of Cornell in a while. Uh, you know, um, it's, a, it's a really great way to, to, to reach people yeah. you know, in a format where people are, you know, people who do, who are able to join the event live can ask questions and those kinds of things, but then it's, it's available in a recorded form. You don't have to do PowerPoints or anything like that, sitting and talking about That's right, so you can do PowerPoints and things like that if you have something that really needs that, mm -hmm. something that's really technical or something like that. But uh, we just did, just uh, last week, we had a really terrific uh, three-person panel um, with three faculty members just talking. Um, you know, and, and it, was a, it was a really neat yeah. panel discussion on, okay. uh, on the leadership topics. Yeah, in this format, I think, you know, trying to build it in such a way that there's interaction with the live audience is kind of much more interesting to me. Um, I have a bias towards that in any case, but sort of, you know, having people ask questions and responding to that, because that's the point of this format is to sort of really get that, that live feel. So, so people pay for access? That's the it can be done either way. Um, these are pretty easy and relatively low cost to create. Um, uh, so we, we, you know, generally charge, but then, you know, right now we're pretty liberal and kept giving access keys saying, yeah, you charge, but because you're a part of this group, you know, here, here you go, here's free access to you. Um, so, you know, free, people don't put a lot of value on free. Yeah. And so sometimes if it's free, you actually get less participation for when there's, when there's actually um, some nominal fee for it. By the way, that's something that we can do with any number of the learning experiences, right, is this idea of uh, an offer code, uh, right? Or if you're a member of such and such a community, you know, you can have sort of something could be free or steeply discounted or something like that. And that's all supported by the types of infrastructure. Um, we're all these questions. All right. Switching gears to something completely different. Um, we talked about MOOCs earlier. Uh, uh, Cornell has created uh, a number of really interesting MOOCs, and I think that the key opportunity here is to, to provide thought leadership and awareness for the, the Cornell brand. Um, of course, the model is a little bit more challenging in many cases because it's, it's you know you need you need funding and there's there's money that needs to be put up front to, to build these. And sometimes they don't generate a ton of revenue, but it definitely puts Cornell on the map and help with recruiting students to a program um, and so on. And so one of my favorite ones that. Uh, uh, Cornell has built um, through, um, again, Diane's team, right, is uh, something that's uh, uh, on sharks. In fact, sharks, biodiversity, biology, and conservation. It's really learning about these topics from the point of view of sharks. And it's, a, it's actually just a really well-produced, um, fascinating, fascinating course. And, you know, I think reflects really well on the Cornell brand. Um, I'll just show a couple of examples. A lot, this is on the edX platform, of course. And, um, uh, and let's see if I can find something, a video here to show. But yeah, so it's just, uh, it's just you know, it's also a little bit fun because there's a lot of sharp video in it and, and, and so on. And uh, it, it has a lot of the same exact components that we've already looked at. And um, we also oh, partnered with the University of Queensland to, in Australia to, to work on this. We had some great footage from Australia. And they are running the move right now in Australia, and well, globally, but they're, they're running it from their, their office instead of us running it. So it's a really interesting partnership. Is that because they also have e learning? They are on edX, and so we co sponsored the book together. Yeah. It's really, I'd recommend it if you have any interest in sharks or biology. <laughs> you know, it's one of several great. Well, I'm really thrilled to be talking with Greg Skomel senior fisheries biologist and expert in shark tracking. So why don't you start by telling our students a little bit about yourself, uh, your job, how you became. So, uh, again, well-produced, really interesting um, set of content that um, you know, definitely demonstrates uh, you know, Cornell's expertise. So it's just a, yet another format and example. Um, you can go on to edX if you're interested in that, look up Cornell and, and see all of the things. Most of these, I think, at this stage are in what, they, what I call what's health pace status. So you may not have the same level of engagement and interaction, but it's still it's still great content. 
So with that, I think I'm running out of time here. So that I kind of went through and, and showed visuals of a bunch of different things. Um, does anyone have any 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 questions? Yes, Christina. Um, both Diane and Paul here. If I'm an outsider coming to Cornell and I want to know what online courses are available, do you know we have the Cornell online learning website? Or how does that interact with Cornell? How would I know where to as, as an individual looking for a, corner, a course yeah, in Cornell? Yeah, I don't know Cornell University instruction. Right. How do you find all this? Well, if you're a student on the outside looking at that, the online learning portal, so there's a Cornell has... Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm aware of the portal. I'm aware of the portal. So I just did a Google search online at Cornell. You know, basically there's a portal, which um, which kind of is an aggregate view of, of a lot of the different things available at Cornell. The two big catalogs right now would be eCornell and the School of Continuing Education, but there's a lot of other smaller programs kind of scattered scattered about. Cooperative it, extension. Yep. Courses yep. Or, yep. Cooperative extension. And like and there's a. Uh, um, yeah, it's a nice meta catalog of everything. So the ability there, and then you click on this, it's going to bring you to to a place to register for one of these, or give you more information about how to get to one of them. Yes. Yeah, EDX seems to have a specific format for class, specific way of organizing it, feedback, and all that. Uh, and I see you're involved with that. Uh, how does that uh, influence or control or whatever? The way in which you have courses developed here. Well, I think um, you know the MOOCs, which are you know the big MOOC providers are edX, Coursera, Udacity, and so on. There's a, you know they started out as being kind of the educate the world, you know things and the gen general topics. Over the last few years, they've pivoted their models to do stuff that eCornell has done for a long time, which are basically professional courses that you charge a thousand or two thousand, three thousand dollars for, right? Small cohorts, not necessarily massive anymore. So they've all pivoted directly into that space. So I think when thinking about a new course, what's the right vehicle for it? So the advantage of, of, of the MOOCs is the potential for a very big audience, right? And that possibly reach tens of thousands of people, maybe not all of them take the course, a relatively small percentage that actually complete the course, a few percentage. So that's the opportunity with MOOCs. Um, when you start getting into the professional courses, then there's, you know, Cornell has a choice. You know, we have, we can go through, you know, basically these MOOC aggregators or, or kind of go it alone. And every school is faced with this choice right now. And, and there's pros and cons of both of those things. Um, it's really a marketing choice, though. Do you want, it's like, if you have a product, do you want to market yourself or do you want to go to Amazon.com? Right? So do you want to be, if you have a course on, a uh, leadership, you know. So, do you want to basically, you know, have that leadership course on a, an aggregation site along with 500 other schools that have the same course, or do you want to do it yourself? And then, of course, the economics are very different between those two things. So, it's a very dynamic place out there, the, the market. You know, right now, um, you know, the Cornell strategy is for these professional courses is e Cornell because it's, it's quite a successful model. It's one in which you know, we're taking, um, we're differentiating ourselves from what's happening in the MOOCs, largely on the student experience. So we're, we're, we're we kind of view, at least from my perspective, we're a premium brand. We want a premium learning experience that includes experts, includes peer -to -peer, facilitated peer-to-peer -peer interaction. Um, and we want to charge, we'll, we'll charge a price that's, I guess, a, relative to free, a premium price, right? A fair premium price for that experience. And that kind of follows the, the path towards free, which, Ends up actually taking a lot of those instructional support out to help. Did that, add, did that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, yeah, um, oh, please. I, I just wanted to see if, if, if the, plat the platform we use also has a difference, makes a difference in how the course actually looks. Yeah. So I don't know if that was part of your question. It, it was. Because edX were confined by the platform that they yeah. use, right? So we can build it only within the guidelines of what is there. And then, of course, you're using Canvas, we're using Blackboard. So some, somewhat, if there's, if there's models to use that it provides consistency, but sometimes we're confined by platform itself. So they have to decide that up front. Right. Yeah, and I would say the platform, though, in my view, I, and I think you probably agree, is that the platform itself is, is really, I mean, 
the components of the course are the same regardless of the platform. You have videos, you have discussions, you have assignments, you have quizzes. It's like the difference between developing something in Microsoft Word or if it's Google Word or whatever. Different, you know. There's, there's in fact, you know, we we, we uh, uh, Diane's team and E Cornell are working together on a nutrition course, a nutrition health and society yeah. course by uh, by Professor Levinsky. Levinsky, um, you know, and that course is going on two different platforms. But the assets underlying it, and that's a Bit of a, it's a sort of a mechanical pain in the butt, but it's not really that, it's not really complex. Um, you know, the video goes here and here. And, uh, you know, so the platform really is, they're all more or less, to me, it's a commodity, the platforms are commodities. It, uh, the harder part is sort of the content. I would just add that the platform itself doesn't provide that many constraints in terms of the types of the kind of learning experiences and different sort of varieties of them. Uh, that you can include in, in, in one, right? Yeah. So whether you're looking at a MOOC or an Equinome course or a self-guided module, um, you know, the well-designed ones um, usually have, it's usually not a faculty member, him or herself, trying to do it all. Uh, usually you, they have, hopefully, they get to collaborate with an instructional designer. That's that's the expertise they bring, right? It's, it's how, uh, and whether it's a, a, someone from CTI or someone from Cornell, to sort of help figure out, well, based on the, the learning outcomes we're trying to equip to do, uh, what's sort of the right sort of combination of these different types of components that might uh, make up this learning experience, right? So there's sort of a range of components that, regardless of your, your platform, you can come up with a really powerful set of them. And of course, the combination will vary from course to course, module to module, depending on the outcomes you're trying to achieve. And I think, uh, yes, one last question. I think we're probably out of time at that next sure. um, the American Psychological Association, they put together um, CEU courses that they put it into the book. Have you done? I mean, that's a, a revenue. What is the revenue? Um, you know, made the material. Have you done like that with the CEU? Yeah, no, we haven't, we haven't um, been involved in actually sort of, uh, you know, Tying in books. I mean, some of the courses require books and require reading. Um, some of the courses are based on a book that was created at one point, so it's sort of a, a digital version of it. But yeah, so I think the same the same idea is the case. Someone that completes this then gets to continue education. Yeah. So most of E Cornell's courses are eligible for different types of CEUs, from project management to just it depends on sort of what you're after. So. model work both ways where one um, you know you pay for the course and you just you get the CEU if you complete it the other is you complete the course and then you have the option of paying to get the CEU both are both are legitimate options right now at least from the e Cornell perspective the main way that we've done it is just you pay for the course and it happens to come with the CEU if you completed the requirements so I'm gonna wrap up um, thank you so much for having having me here this was a lot of fun and I'm um, certain if you have any questions at all um, you know, because we kind of just did a 60,000 foot view of the world very, very quickly. You know, talk to, feel free to reach out to me, uh, Joe, uh, Diane. Um, happy to, happy to talk. Excited. Thank you so much.